All right. If you have your Bibles, go ahead, go, go to ahead, go, to, go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 29, 11. And as you do so, I'm going to pray because I need it. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. And uh, we just ask that you would bless this time as we study your word. Uh, Lord, I believe that you have a mighty word, a powerful word. You do have a mighty powerful word in the Bible and throughout the Bible. And it is your word. But this morning, I believe you have a powerful word for each and every one of us that you want to speak to our hearts as we study your word. I pray that you would bless my mind and, and anoint my tongue just to not to speak my message and not to speak my thoughts, but to relay your heart to your people this morning, Lord. I pray that we would hear your heart and what your spirit is speaking to us as a church and also to us as families and as individuals, Lord. Lord, your, your holy word tells us that your word does not return void. It does not return empty. And so I pray that that would be true for every heart that is here this morning, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we would hear you. We would know your voice. We would take the lessons and applications that you speak to us and that we would apply them to our lives from this moment forward, Lord. We just ask again that you bless this time. This is for you, Jesus, not for me, not for any of us, but this is ultimately to glorify you, God. And so I pray that we would do that as we study your word. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. 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 All right. How many of you guys have ever faced rejection? Yep, 100%. Rejection is not a popular topic. It's not something that we like to talk about. It's definitely not something that we like to admit that we struggle with or that we're facing in the midst of it and even afterwards. Rejection is a huge, huge problem for many of us. We feel rejected by spouses, rejected by family, rejected by children, Rejected by work, bosses, managers, neighbors. I mean, rejection is everywhere. And rejection is stringing up the bow and shooting its arrows at us every second, every chance that they can. And I believe that that's because rejection really debilitates us a lot of times. Now, some of us are able to handle it a lot more than others. But for most of us, I think that we're all we're very, very sensitive. We may come off as, no, I'm not a sensitive person. I'm a man. You're not going to hurt me. But inside we're like, <laughs> why did you have to say that about me? You're like, goodness, what's wrong with you? You're such a mean person. All right? Now, women, you're more, you, you can do that easily, right? I don't like you. I don't like you. And you can go back and cry and you grab your tub of ice cream and, you know, and, and, and you know, none of you do that, I know. Some women do. But it, it's a little easier for you guys to kind of deal with rejection. Not that you like it, but you can kind of show it more. For guys, we're, like I said, we're, we don't want to show it. But we all face rejection, no matter, where, no matter whether we show it or not. And I believe this morning that God is speaking to each and every one of us. That he's saying, son, daughter, you have rejection. Some of us, we have rejection issues. It keeps reoccurring in, in our lives. But I want to make you whole this morning. I want to remove those arrows those lies that you have been spoken to, that you have heard and that you have believed. And I want to remove those. And as Pastor Craig taught a few weeks ago, I want to fill it. I want to fill that wound with the truth. And that's that I love you. I have chosen you before the foundations of the earth to be a representation of me, to be a child of mine. I've adopted you into my family. I knew the rejection you'd face. I knew the trouble you would be in. I knew the, the things that you were going to do. But still, I have chosen you to be my son. I have chosen you to be my daughter. And I really believe that when we believe that with all of our heart, that we see God move in mighty ways throughout our lives. That we see God do mighty things in our families, here at church. 
And I think that's one of the things that really holds us back from worshiping on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. We'll have some Sunday mornings where all, all of us were, yes, praise Jesus, amen, raising our hands, we worship you, we praise you, Lord. And then we have some Sundays where we're like, there's an army rising. Or like Pastor Craig always says, we're like, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Right? We don't want to worship. We're like, no, I'm not doing it. Why is that? I believe it's because we've hardened our hearts because of hurts that we've faced in life. Hurts that we've faced from other people. Rejection. And that comes through when we come to worship God. And what I want to encourage you guys to do this morning, and as I say you guys, I mean myself, is to surrender those hurts to the Lord. You can be real with Him. Have you ever read the Psalms? They're pretty real. God, where are you? God, why are you letting this happen to me? God, why have all forsaken me? Why have all these people, the very people that ate at my dinner table, have turned their backs on me? But what's awesome about the Psalms is that they'll be real. They'll question. They'll ask. But at the end, they always turn the glory to God and say, but God, I know you're greater. I know you're good. And I know you're doing something. And so I encourage you to do that. As I said, all, as I, you guys all said, we all suffer from rejection. We face rejection issues. Allow Christ, allow the Holy Spirit to minister in your heart to show you those areas and let him remove those arrows and replace it with his truth, that he loves you. And a verse today that we're going to study, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This verse is used quite often, but we don't always realize the implications of this verse. If you think about it, God, not just the creator of all things, he is. He's creator of all things seen, all things unseen. But he's also the one who sustains it all. He keeps it all running. He keeps it all together. You guys remember back in middle school studying the atom? Right? And it's got, and I'm so bad at remembering this stuff, but it's got what, the, the two new, neutrons? Protons, electrons, all the ions. But... <laughs> Really, they shouldn't be together, right? They should be repelling each other, but somehow they're together. And that's the depth of my knowledge of science. That's all I can say on that matter. If you want to know more, you can talk to, you can talk to the, uh, uh, Larissa and Jeff over here. They're, they're uh, rocket surgeons. And so, um, play on words. And so, but anyways, <laughs> God keeps it all together. The things that we see in nature that shouldn't be, they are because God sustains it. He's keeping it together. But on top of that, on top of, on top, you think about how many atoms there are, right? Yeah, he's keeping them all together, but yet he still has time to focus on you. Not you as the church. He does, but you as an individual. He has time to focus on you and what it is that he wants to do in your life. Colossians 1.17 says he existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. Isaiah 44.24 Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. He has no help. He needs no help. He does it all on his own. And yet he still has that time to focus on you and what's going on in your life. The same God who does all that also came up with a plan for each one of us. For every human being that is living now, that has ever lived, and that will live. He came up with a future for each of us. When we think about that, about how much he thinks towards us and how much of a plan he has for us on top of everything else he's got to take care of, we catch a glimpse of how much God loves you and I. God was speaking this verse through the prophet Jeremiah, letting Israel know, or letting the Jews know that he does care for them and he wants what is best for them. So why is he saying this? Why is he taking time to show this, to say this to the Jews? 
If you know anything about Jeremiah, you know that he's been nicknamed the weeping prophet. Why? Because he wept a lot. And why did he weep? Because people weren't listening to him. Here is God Almighty speaking his heart to Jeremiah. Jeremiah sharing it with his fellow Jews, family members, friends, community, and they all reject him. They all say, oh, yeah, whatever, dude, okay. Right? They don't want to listen to him. They have many other prophets around that are saying, things are good. We're going to enter into an even more glorious age than before. Uh, everything is awesome. <laughs> that was not intentional. Um, but everything's awesome. Everything's good. And yet here's Jeremiah sticking out like a sore thumb saying, no, no, it's not all good. Everything is bad. And there's judgment coming for us because we've rejected God Almighty. God was using Jeremiah to prophesy his frustration and his anger with the Israelites, with the Jews. And they all hated Jeremiah for it. At this time, when this verse was spoken by God, God was telling them that they're going to be taken captive by Babylon. But he wasn't just punishing them. He was allowing this to make them better. And we, as we study the period of Babylonian captivity, we see that when the Jews returned from captivity, they never again returned to worshiping false gods until they rejected Jesus Christ. But up until that point, they never went back to following and to worshiping false gods. Up to this point, they had always chosen to follow false gods. They wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to be accepted. They wanted to do what everyone else was doing at the time, what they were worshiping. But when they went into captivity, they were then forced to worship false gods. They weren't given a choice. And that's how it is even today in our lives. We choose what sin we want to enjoy. We choose what sin we don't want to enjoy. Eventually, we become slave to that sin. And then it becomes something that we have to do, not that we want to do anymore, like drugs, right? A lot of people start off using drugs in high school because they want to. They want to have fun. They want to do what their friends are doing. But then years later, they're now slave to that drug or to alcohol or to whatever it is. They can't get rid of it. They're slaves to it. Then when they give their lives to Christ, we're freed from that sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're now free in Christ. He's made us free by his death on the cross and forgiving us and, and, and placing the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us that, that, that determination and that ability to, to say no to that sin. We're no longer slaves to it. We're free from it. But captivity does teach us a lesson. It taught the Jews a lesson. They had been worshiping and serving false gods like Molech. Mammon, Ashtoreth, Baal, for so long, sacrificing babies, sacrificing humans, cutting themselves, doing atrocious things. They were continually getting caught up in it. But even though they were doing all this stuff, they were choosing to worship false gods before captivity, God was preparing a plan for them. I shouldn't say preparing. He had a plan prepared for them. Even in the midst of false idol worship, in the midst of throwing babies into fire, in the midst of, of just, like I said, atrocious, horrible things, he was preparing, he had a plan for them. And not a plan to punish and to make them feel bad and, con and to condemn them, but a plan for a future and a hope, a plan for good and not for evil. Here is God looking at his people trample over his law and his grace and mercy and all that he's done for them, and yet he's planning a future and a hope for them. Now, when I read that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, seriously? Seriously, God? These people are rejecting you. They don't want you, and yet you're, you're preparing, a, you have a plan for them? A good plan for good and not evil? See, you and I don't understand that. That's foreign to us. Someone hurts us, what do we do? I never liked you anyways, right? I say, ditch him. I don't want anything to do with you. But that's not God. That's not Christ. He's forgiven us, and he's got a plan for you. When you and I are far from God doing our own thing, God is still planning a hope and a great future for us. 
The first point I want to share with you guys this morning is that God's plans for us are birthed out of his love for us. We know we can trust in his plan and follow it because of the love that he has for us. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, I'll read it to you guys. Jesus says this, What man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? He wants to give us good things. You ever think about that? God wants to give you good things. Sometimes we view God as a grumpy old man up in heaven or a standoffish type of person. I once heard the uh, radio personality Michael Savage. You guys heard of him? I once heard him talk about God, and he was saying how he believes that there is a God, and he believes in God, but he doesn't believe that God is a loving, kind, compassionate God. He believes that God is an angry, grumpy God, wanting to punish those who don't follow him. That's actually pretty prevalent in this society. People don't view God as a loving, kind, compassionate God. And we could do a whole other series of sermons on that topic, but I don't have time for that. But they do. They view him as that. But that's so not true. Zephaniah, how many of you guys even knew there was a book called Zephaniah? 317 says, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever viewed God as that? Have you ever viewed God as singing over you? It's a little weird. It's a little foreign. Have you ever pictured someone, a human, singing over you? That would be creepy, right? You wake up, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you in my room? Who are you? That's just weird, you know? But that's not weird for God. God loves you so much that he's singing over you. He's rejoicing over you. And notice what he says there. He will quiet you with his love. Has his love ever quieted you? Girls, I think you can relate to this. Women. When your husband, back in the early days, says, I love you. And you're like, oh, I love you too. Right? And it just quiets us. We're like, oh, us. Not us, you. It quiets you. I'm not a female, I promise. It quiets you, right? That love. Or, or when your spouse, when your spouse, and guys, we can relate to this too. When your spouse does something out of love that just blesses your heart, it kind of quiets you, doesn't it? And you're just like, I know for me, I'll speak from my life. When that happens to me, I just, I, I get quiet. And I get quiet because I'm just thinking to myself, how do I deserve this? How can I have such an awesome wife? And maybe if you're not married, it's just, how can I have such an awesome friend? Or an awesome parent? Parents like, yeah. Or an awesome grandparent, or whoever it is. But love, true love, agape love, unconditional love, when that's displayed to us, it quiets us. Does God's love quiet you? And I hope and pray that it does because he's rejoicing over you. He loves you so much that he's rejoicing over you. He's singing over you. A lot of times I think he's disappointed with me. And I think you guys can relate. Because I can never seem to get it right. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Pfft, doing bad. All right. Doing good. Doing good. Doing, pfft, doing bad. And then I just kind of get like, ugh, I just can't. What is wrong with me, right? And I, and I get sucked into that fleshly feeling of I can't do anything right. I don't know how you love me, God. I, I don't know if you do right now because I'm just getting it so wrong. Can we disappoint him or grieve him? Yes, we can. But that does not mean that his love for us diminishes. 1 Peter 5, 6-7 through says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, 
Why? Because he cares for you. Yeah, you're going to screw up. You're going to do it wrong. You're going to get it wrong. You're going to hurt people. You're going to get hurt. But that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Just like with your children. They'll anger you. Some of them will anger you to no end. You want to strangle them. Hopefully none of you have. But you'll want to. But that doesn't mean you don't love them. It's the same with God, you guys. A lot of times we, we portray onto God what we've experienced in life. And it's kind of unfair if you think about it. Because God's done nothing but be faithful. God's done nothing but love us. Even when we disappoint, even when we grieve his spirit because of the things that we do, the things we think, the things we choose to do, it doesn't diminish his love for you and I. Psalm 86 verse 5 says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And then 1 John 4, 8, very popular verse, says that God, what, is love. He is love. And not just love like, you know, conditional love, but agape love. I looked it up in that verse. It's agape love. And we, a lot of us Christians, we know what agape means. Unconditional love. Meaning there is nothing you can do to earn or to merit God's love. In marriage, a lot of times, we love to say that our marriage is unconditional. Our love is unconditional. But a lot of times our love is conditional. But that's not, so, that's not true with the Lord. His love is always unconditional. There's so many other verses in the Bible that talk about God's love and show us his love for us that we don't have time to even go through them. But when you read verses like these, do they motivate you to please him? Do they motivate you to live for him? If they don't, then you have an issue with pride. You think, of course God loves me. Why wouldn't he? Look at this. Hello. All right? That's what I say to Rachel. Of course you love me. Look, look at this, you know. I don't need no gym. I'm good to go, right? No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Poor Rachel. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. But if, if that doesn't motivate us to really live for God, then, guys, you got a pride issue. Because when we think about how much God loves us, that should motivate you. That should kick you in the butt. That should get you going to live for him every day of your life. That should get you going to where you want to say, you know what, I don't want this sin. I don't want pornography. I don't want alcoholism. I don't want drug use. I don't want bitterness. I don't want anger. I don't want sin in my life anymore. I want to live for you, and I want to glorify you with all that I am, with all that I breathe. Why? Because you love me, God. And you displayed your love for me on the cross. In marriage, I'm sure you've noticed that you and your spouse, as you grow closer, you find that your love grows stronger. Rachel and I, is she in here? She's not in here, so I can get a little emotional and weep, and she won't think I'm weak. Um, but when, I'm kidding, she sees me do it all the time. Um, when uh, we're, we're young in our marriage, six years. We just celebrated six years of marriage. And thank you. To me, it's like, it feels, it feels short, but at the same time, it feels like we've been together forever. And then I talk to some of you, like, that's, that's extremely short, right? We've been married 20 years. I think my grandparents were married 50, 50 plus years. I think both sets were. And, uh, you know, so when you think of it like that, six years is like, it's nothing. But I found in our short marriage that the, the, the closer we grow to each other, the stronger our love for each other is. And it surprises me, and it's surprising, and men, you can nod in agreement. We won't hold it against you. We'll, we'll remove it from the video. We'll edit it out. But we find ourselves feeling a way for someone that we never thought we would feel. That love. Come on, men, do you? Come on. Come on. Women, close your eyes. Okay, men, yes? Okay. We do. We feel a way for someone that we never thought we would feel for someone before. We never just thought about it. It's just, oh my goodness, I love this person so much. It's the same with us and God. It's the same with us and Jesus. As we grow closer to him through studying his word, through prayer, through worship, through obeying him, our love for him grows stronger and stronger. What's awesome is that his love isn't growing stronger and stronger. It is strong, and it's never going to weaken Well, I feel that way 
as I grow to, lo- to know the Lord more, as I grow to love him, my love for him grows stronger. We need to remember that he loves us, and especially during difficult times. What do you think the Jews were feeling when they were taken into captivity and taken away from the promised land that God had given them? Every other time they cried out to God, God saved them. God moved. God did miracles. But this time, he's silent in the way of rescue. But he's very vocal in the way of warning what's going to happen. So when the Jews go through this, they're taken into captivity to Babylon, I'm sure they were thinking, why, God? Why? Every other time we have called out to you, you have been the only God that has saved us. You and I are tempted with those questions too. But we need to remember, why did God allow that to happen to the Jews? To teach them consequences of sin. To show them life without God's blessing. But also because of Proverbs 3.12. God disciplines those he loves like a father disciplines his favorite child. He wants to teach us. He wanted to teach the Jews not to wander away. Not to go after false loves, false gods, false idols. And it's so true for you and I too. We replace God with so many stupid things in our lives. Things that at the moment aren't stupid. And if someone were to say that, you'd punch them in the face. But to us, it's like, this is what I want. I'm passionate. I need this. I want this. But we put it in front of God. And then we wonder why God's silent or things are going crazy or awry in our lives. He wants to teach us. He wants us to know to not do those things that hurt us. It's just like teaching your kids not to do things that will harm them, right? Sometimes you got to let them touch that burner. Sometimes you got to let them stick that fork in the toaster. <laughs> Three times. Sometimes you got to let them stick that fork in the, in the socket, in the outlet, right? And then you grab their hand and keep it in there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, just kidding. He's in the foyer. Um, but, you know, sometimes we have to let our kids, your kids, I don't have kids, sometimes you've got to let them learn the hard way. And God is the same. Not because he's angry, not because he wants to punish you because he's harsh and mean, but because sometimes what's one of the best ways to learn things? Through pain, right? When you're working out, as you can tell, I am very good at When you're working out, as a total joke, when you're working out, what's, how, do you t- how do you teach your muscles to grow? through Twinkies and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups and ice cream. Amen. Yeah, it, yeah, I know. That's what my flesh is screaming. Amen. But it doesn't work, and I'm living proof of it. What works is pain, right? Pushing those muscles, stretching those muscles, tearing those muscles. Pain. It's, it's, it's true with life, too, guys. Why does God allow pain in our lives? Because he's teaching you something. Not because he's mean, not because he hates you. We're, we're tempted to think that a lot of times we do think that, and it's not true. But God allows us because he wants to teach us dependence on him. He wants to teach us reliance on him. He wants to teach us true love. True love does not force. True love allows. The second point this morning is that God's plans for us are trustworthy We know that they're trustworthy because of his nature, because of who he is. God is the most solid, unwavering, unchanging person we will ever know. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. He never lets us down. God's counsel is always faithful. It is always true. And it always works. How many times have we needed advice on a life decision and received bad advice? It happens a lot. Um... We were watching Saved by the Bell a few years ago, and uh, the kids in the show set up an advice hotline, for a teen advice hotline for the school. And it was becoming very successful. And so they said, well, why, why is this so successful? Because we give them bad advice. And then they come back to us. So they need more advice. So we just keep giving them bad advice, so they keep coming. So it looks like this great, successful thing, but they're misleading all these kids. It's a pretty funny episode. But God's not like that. The advice that God gives us is perfect. It works. 
And why do we go back for him for more? Back to him for more? Because we see how good it is. See, in the show, eventually the kids figured it out and they ended it. But with God, you keep going back to him and you follow that advice. See, what happens a lot of times is we don't follow the advice. We get advice from God and we say, thank you so much, God, but I'm not going to do it. And then everything fails. Everything falls apart and we wonder, God, your advice didn't work. Yeah, bonehead, because you didn't do it. We have to actually do the things that God speaks to us, God tells us to do. But anyways, his advice for us is perfect. We see all throughout the Bible that God is faithful all the time. We can never catch him on a bad day. You know, the, the, the Muslims, their God, little g God, you can catch him on a bad day. Their, their Quran says it. If you die... You've lived a perfect life. You die. You catch him on a bad day. You are going to hell. Well, I, kinda, I don't want to serve a God like that. Big G God, real God, is not like that. You won't catch him on a bad day. You know, there's theology out there that says if, you, if you, you're up on the roof, smash your thumb with the hammer, curse word falls out as you're falling down and break your neck and die, you lose your salvation. You go to hell. I don't prescribe to that. I don't believe in that. We at Calvary don't believe in that. And the reason why is because I don't see God's love in that. Now, you can get into a whole debate about that, right? One saved, always saved. You can lose your salvation, all that stuff. But just because you screw up once, or not once, but that one time, and you go to heaven. It's not like you're gonna. You just angered God so much. He's like, How, "There's no way I could let you in here because of that word that came out of your mouth." I just don't see that. I don't see that in the word. I don't see that in His nature. I don't see that in Him. Second Timothy two thirteen says that even when we are unfaithful or faithless, He is still faithful. He is solid. He is unwavering. Because of that, we can trust in His plan for our lives. What is for what is truly best for us. And Psalms 136 says that his love never fails. Sometimes his advice is hard. Think about when Jesus said that if your right hand causes you to stumble, what? Spank it, tell it, no, it's a bad boy, it's a bad girl, and that's it? Ground it? No. Cut it off. All right? Cut it off. And he's not saying to literally cut it off. He's saying cut off the things in your life that cause you to sin, that, that cause you to stumble. Get rid of it. I need my computer. Get rid of it. And Jesus goes on to say it's better to enter the kingdom of heaven with one hand than it is to enter hell, basically, with two hands. Or to enter the kingdom of heaven with one eye instead of entering hell with two eyes, with a perfect body. His advice, like I said, isn't always easy. But we know through his faithfulness and through his unwavering love that he knows what is best. And if he says to get rid of it, to do something, to not do something, we know that we can trust it and that we can do what it is that he tells us. The best example of this in the Bible is Jesus going to the cross. The Father knew what was best for humanity. He knew what was needed, but it required the sacrifice of his Son. Jesus wasn't the only one who had to sacrifice on that day. God had to sacrifice his Son. And we see through the obedience of Jesus that Jesus knew he could trust the Father's plan, no matter how hard it was. Because Jesus could trust in his plan and God's plan, then we know that we too can trust in God's plan, no matter how hard or difficult it may seem or will be. Father truly knows best. Best? Best. So how do we know what that plan is? How do you know what God's plan is for your life? Some of us go through life not ever knowing. Just kind of hoping that we did it, not knowing what it was. First of all, through reading the Bible. Read the Bible. Not just to study, not just because you have to, but read it to know God's heart. To know what he expects out of his followers. Daniel had purpose in his heart that he would follow God no matter what the cost. And we see through his life, we're studying the book of Daniel on Sundays with Pastor Craig. We see through his life that he was blessed and he accomplished great things among hard and trying times. 
His friends were thrown into a blazing furnace. He was thrown into a den of lions, but yet they all survived. He saw Jesus Christ face to face. He met Michael, an archangel. He was used mightily. What makes him different than us? He had purpose in his heart. And why do I point that out? Because as you read God's word, you're going to see examples of men and women that have done it right and that have done it wrong. To know God's plan for your life, it's important, it's essential to be reading about these other people. Because we see how to follow God. We see how he wants us to respond, the things he wants us, and what he'll do, how he'll reward us, what he'll do in our lives as we, as we purpose to live for him. The second way to know God's plan for our lives is to pray. We have not because we ask not. Pray and ask God, what is your plan for me, God? What is your plan for my life? Now, I don't believe that God always gives us the five-year plan, the 20-year plan, the 30-year plan. I believe a lot of times he'll give us kind of like a day-to-day plan. He might give you something to, to, to aim for. He'll give you something. He'll give you a desire. I had a desire when I was 13, 14 to be in ministry. He'll give you that desire. You don't know how it's going to play out. I didn't for a while. It seemed like it wasn't. But I'm here. Amen. He doesn't lay out the whole plan in one sitting. Uh, here's a story. Once there was a rich man who had a son to whom he promised an annual allowance. <clears throat> Every year on the same day, he would give his son the entire amount. After a while, it happened that the only time the father saw his son was on the day of allowance. So the father changed his plan and only gave the son enough for each day. Then the next day, the son would return. From then on, the father saw his son every day. This is the way God dealt with Israel. It is the way that God deals with us, too. He desires a daily relationship with us, not just when we need him. For a lot of us, God is a God of emergencies. For a lot of us, God is a God of of chaotic times. But he's not. He's a God of everyday life. And he wants to be in your everyday life. When you commit to spending time to pray and seek God, he commits to responding to you and to speaking to you. When I did that early on, when I was, when I was a youngster, just kidding, <laughs> when I, I'm, I'm a youngster, when I was 20 years old, okay, I, I committed to praying every day. And I said, Lord, I just want to hear you. I want to know what your plan is for my life. I want to know what you want me to do. In one specific area, I just prayed, Lord, what are, what are my gifts? If I'm going to live for you, I need to know what my gifts are. And he gave me, he, he gave me four things, four gifts to pray for, to, to, to pray that I would move in and that I would exercise. And no one else knew that I was doing that, but people in my life all of a sudden started confirming those specific gifts in my life. You want to know God's plan for your life? You want to know what he wants to do through you, gift-wise, through you family-wise, through you life-wise? Ask him. Pray. Spend time with God. And not just while you're doing your makeup or while you're working out or while you're driving or you know, at, stud, at, at church. <laughs> Do it, just set aside, you know, 10 minutes a day at the very least to just sit before the Lord and just say, Lord, speak to me. I want to know your plan. I went through two pages of notes without looking at them, sorry. Sometimes we deviate from God's plan or we decide, not, we decide to follow our own plan. What we need to understand is that our obedience and our disobedience, it affects our lives. I think we all know that. But it affects more than just our lives too. It affects those around us. When we don't have a plan, when we don't know God's plan for our lives because we're, just, we're not asking him, we're not seeking it, that will affect more than just you. It will affect the people around you. Henry Blackaby, had a, he wrote a book called The Man God Uses. He tells a story of his grandfather in World War II. They had a minefield that they had to cross, and so they were told to stay put until the mine expert arrived. When the expert arrived, he told the men, I will take you across on one condition. Whenever I tell you to do something, do it without question. It will mean your life and mine if you don't. The expert took the men all the way across the field, and what Henry points out is that his father's future as well as his children and his grandchildren's futures, depended on his obedience on that one day. Our decisions to obey God or not affects our futures, but also our children's future, grandchildren's future. Other times we'll follow God's plan and then take the blessing and use it selfishly. 
Henry Blackaby, he, he's known for Experiencing God, the Experiencing God series. Told a study, told, in one study, told about a man that had heard from God that he was called to go to medical school and then go out into the missionary field to third world countries and to, uh, to minister through, um, through medicine, through health, through being a doctor. And so he went to school. He went to, um, I don't know what it's called when you go and study in the hospital. Um, internship. He did an internship. Uh, he did very well. He, 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 he succeeded at it. And he got offered, eventually, he got offered one of the head positions at a hospital, a prestigious hospital. And he thought, this has to be God. So he did it. He was making good money. Life was good. They didn't have any disasters. He had children. I think he even had grandchildren. Everything was going good. They loved the Lord. But through listening to Henry's study on experiencing God, he realized, he recognized, I haven't heard the voice of God in my life for a long time. And so he went and asked Henry, and Henry said, well, when was the last time you heard God's voice? He said, really, it was when I heard my calling to go into the medical field. And then it dawned on him, I didn't fulfill the second part. I got so caught up with success and blessing that I forgot. So he left his position, took a huge, huge pay decrease, and he went over to third world countries and started ministering. And he started hearing God's voice every day. See, a lot of times we do that. We take God's blessing. We take his plan, and then we use it selfishly. We use it for our own gain. Is it good? You might be having a good life, but you're not having that close relationship with the Lord. You're not having that daily relationship with him. So it's important that as we learn God's plan for our lives, that we continue to stay with him through fulfilling that plan. We all make these mistakes. We follow our own ideas or we take God's plan and we make tweaks to it. We do what we think would be good for it. We marry the person God says not to. We date a person that the Bible says not to even associate with. We go places that we shouldn't. We hang out with people that we shouldn't. We do things that we shouldn't. We watch things that we shouldn't. Listen to things that we shouldn't. So I want to ask you guys, what does that mean in relation to God's plan for our lives? When we screw things up, when we, when we just throw it all out the window, does that mean that God no longer has a plan for us? Does that mean that God is not going to use us anymore? Not at all. Romans 8.28 says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. And we know through reading multiple times through his word that he's, a God of, he's, he's the Redeemer. He buys back the stolen time. He buys back the wasted years. So when we deviate, when we screw up, we do our own thing, it's not good. And I'm not saying do it so you experience God's grace. Not at all. Don't do it. But if you found, if you're here this morning, you find that you have just gone off the rails spiritually. You're not with God. You're not doing your own, you're doing your own thing. You're not following him. That doesn't mean your life is wasted. That doesn't mean that you are of no use to God anymore. It says that he works out all things together for good for those who love him. Come back to him. Recommit your life to him, and he'll work out those wasted years. He'll work them out for good, and he'll be able to use them in your life. We don't always know why he plans the way he does. Things will happen in our lives that we don't understand, that we don't think are good for us. But let Jeremiah 29, 11 be in your head constantly. We know he is trustworthy and that he does not plan evil for our lives but peace. Then why did he take my child away? Why did he take my parents away? Why was I born into this family? Every teenager has thought that. Instead of asking why, ask what. What are you doing in my life? What are you teaching me through this? What do you want me to do? We know that he is loving, that he has a plan, and that he wants to do great things through you. He has a plan for us, and that plan was made before we were even a twinkle in our grandmother's eye. Look back at Jeremiah 29, 11. The Hebrew word here for peace means completeness. In the original King James, the end of the verse says to give you hope and a future. It says to give you an expected end. Which in Hebrew, the word for that phrase is tikva. This word means hope, which is why it's translated hope and a future. But what's neat is, when I looked at the, it's got two meanings, tikva, hope. 
it's, it's a, a, a figurative, like we put our hope in God, right? It's not a hope, like I hope God is real. Our hope is in God. We're hoping, our hope is in a future. We know that it's coming, and that's what we live for. But the literal meaning of it is a cord, C-O-R-D, like a rope, a cord to pull, to hang on to. And it was neat, because when you put those two together, completeness and a cord, God gives us a plan, his plan for us, the hope that he gives us is a cord to pull us through life as we find completeness in Him. Isn't that neat? The hope He gives us is a cord to pull us through life. He doesn't just throw you, I always said this when I taught youth, He doesn't just throw you on this earth and say, figure it out, good luck. He puts us on this earth, and then He gives us His Word, and He gives us His Spirit. And He says, I will lead you, I will guide you, I will teach you. It's amazing that God wants to give us this hope and this peace in our lives. We have done nothing to earn it. We've done everything to earn hell and punishment. But we've done nothing to earn God's love, and yet he still gives it to us. We've done nothing to earn a a plan for good and not evil, a future and a hope in our lives. But yet he made it for us. He's given it to us. And it says that it doesn't just say that he made it, but it says that the thoughts I think towards you He's always thinking, not just about us, like, oh, wow, think about that person. He's thinking towards you. He's thinking, how can I bless you? How can I teach you? How can I help you to understand what I'm doing in your life? He's thinking towards us all the time. It's really cool. Can you put up the PowerPoint, Alyssa? I want to show this to you guys to kind of show us just how, how much God truly loves us. Have you ever thought about how much you sin? in one day. Something we don't really think about. We don't like to think about it, and I don't blame us. But if you think about it, the average lifespan of a human is 71 years. So let's say the average person sins 10 times a day. Now, that's being conservative. (laughs) But let's be nice to us today. We sin 10 times a day, all right? That means that in one year, We've sinned 3,650 times. Okay? Now multiply that by 71 years. You got 259,150 sins in a lifetime. Now we're so used today to words like trillions and billions, so that, that's, that doesn't really rock us a whole lot. But when you think about the fact that it just takes one sin to deserve hell, and we do that many, and it's probably like that, plus a few zeros, realistically, but I'm not good at math. So I stick to the easy numbers, 10. All right, so now let's think about the whole world. If everyone sinned 3,650 times a year, there's uh, 7.125 billion people in the world. That means 26 trillion, 6 billion, 250 million sins in one year. In one year. If it's not right, don't worry about it. I'm not good at math. Just just go with it. All right. That's just in one year. If you try and multiply that by 71, you're going to blow your phone up. You're going to blow your calculator up. They're not that smart. And then you think about all the people that have lived. When you study the Bible, you see that this earth has had humans for 7,000 years at least. Some people believe millions. I personally believe 7,000. That's a whole other teaching for a whole other year. But let's just say 7,000 at least. We can't comprehend that that much sin. We can't. It'll it'll blow our minds. We got that from a pastor at a pastor's conference last week. I think it's pretty cool. Right? When you try and compute, you know, does not compute. It just was not going to work. But that's how awesome God is. And that's how awesome God's thoughts are towards us. He sees that. He was immersed in it when he died on the cross. He took our sins on our behalf. That sin. More than that sin, because we sin more than probably ten times a day. But that's how much he loves you and I. Psalm 139, 17 and 18 How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. 
They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. I have one last story for you, and then we'll, we'll end for today. You can exit out. Oh, you already did. Good job. Dr. Michael Japes, Jacobson cited a study in which patients were asked to recall various types of emotional experiences while doctors monitored how it affected their bodies. I believe this study was done in the 90s. Each patient was asked to relive the experience in their minds for five minutes. When the patients thought for five minutes about experiences that made them depressed, they found out that it affected the patient's immune system and their antibody levels dropped 55%. Six hours later, their immune system was still depressed. But when the patients thought for five minutes about situations that made them happy, their antibodies rose 40%. The levels rose 40%, and it was still elevated six hours later. This is medical evidence that the thoughts we think affects our bodies, either positively or negatively. And when you read Jeremiah 29, 11, we know that his thoughts towards us are not for evil, they're for good, for peace, for completeness, and for a hope, for his hope, for the hope. When you realize that his thoughts towards you are not evil, are not bad, but good, that should make your antibody levels in your body burst. <sighs> just blow out of your body. You're just antibodies. Woo right? I don't know what that means, but you know, it, it, you should be happy. We should always. We should be a happy people. We should be a, ju a, a what, what's the word? Uh, ju jubilant. Thank you. A jubilant people. Right? We should be happy in the midst of trials and tribulations. We should be happy. Not false happiness, but real happiness. Why? Because God's thoughts toward us are not for evil and are not bad, but for good, for hope and for peace. Now, again, this is not an excuse to go out and sin. This is not an excuse to live life how you want to, because there are intense consequences for that. But as we're living for Christ, as we're doing our best in this life, know that he loves you that he has a plan for you, for a good, for a hope. He's given you that hope to pull you through life. All we have to do is grab on and trust in him. And of course, we could go on and on and on about this. We could go way deeper. But that's for you to do on your own with Christ in your situations, what you're going through, what you're dealing with. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for how good you are to us, God. When we do all that we, we do and all that we can do to push you away, to make you say, no more, I don't want you anymore, I'm done with you, you, you don't do that. You're there for us. As, as a song I, I love says, you're, you're there waiting by the phone all the time. And we thank you for that, Jesus. Right now, we thank you in our own words for your love. We just thank you. I pray that you would help us to live for you all the days of our lives, Lord. I pray for anyone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that they have heard this and that they realize, wow, I, have a, I never realized that's how God was. And if that's you, God is calling you to a, a relationship with him this morning. Because he has a plan for you. Not for evil, but for good. To give you a hope and a future. An expected end. And all you have to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. You recognize, you admit, you repent that you're a sinner. And that you've been doing things your own way. But you choose this morning to accept his gift of love. And his gift of salvation. The work he did on the cross was to forgive you, to pay the penalty for your sins. And as you do that, you become a child of his. So Lord, we just, we just I think all of us could say, we just afresh recommit our lives to you this morning. We want to live for you, Lord. We want to bless you. We want to do all that we can to give you glory and to, to just love you back, Lord. And I pray that we would have, we would exercise those personal relationships with you letting you speak to us, letting you guide us and direct us, showing us the plans you have for us, Lord. 
Use us this week to reach the lost. Use us this week to reach the, the, the downtrodden, the, the depressed, the frustrated, the angry. Use us to display your love to them, Lord, and to bring them to you or back to you. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Real quick before you guys go, if you've been here for a while, you know that Pastor Craig and I have been competing with jokes. So I got one. Last time I taught, Esther said I have such a sweet heart. I want to change that. <laughs> a child asked his father, how were people born? So his father said, Adam and Eve made babies. Then their babies became adults and made babies and so on. The child then went to his mother, asked her the same question, and she told him, or she asked, she asked her, he asked her the same question, and she told him, we were monkeys. Then we evolved to become like we are now. The child ran back to his father and said, you lied to me. His father replied, no, no, no. Your mom was talking about her side of the family. <laughs>